Welcome back. I'd like to now introduce you to Dr. Deborah Popper, professor at the College of Staten Island. Deborah and her panel will discuss the future geography of economic exclusion and integration. Deborah? Whatever. Do we, actually, do we, none of us turned our mics on, right? They're all on. They're all on now? Oh, when did they go on? <laughs> Let's, can you, you can hear us? Okay, you can hear me. Great. <laughs> You may have been hearing me for a while, because I don't know when the mic went on. OK. <laughs> well, welcome to the session on the future geography of economic exclusion and integration. It's sort of framed as how mechanisms of economic exclusion shape the geography of our cities, perpetuating and even magnifying poverty, inequality, and stunting development and stability. I have with me Claudia Gauch of the Rockefeller Foundation, and Patrick Ellis of the National Geographic Spati Intel Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, as you heard, I'm Deborah Popper. I will be moderating this. I'm a professor of geography, the City University of New York's College of Staten Island, uh, and also Graduate Center, and visiting uh, professor for, for many years at Princeton University, and a longtime council member of American Geographical Society. Now, as we think about this as trying to project into the future to 2050, uh, it's really a necessary challenge. But in truth, even at our best, we are likely to be wrong, maybe about the details, but getting a sense of the big picture. Or maybe we get the big picture, but we don't understand the details particularly well. Maybe we don't get the, we get the details sometimes, and those details miss their meaning. But this is what we have to try to do. Our hope is that parts of our analysis are prescient enough to lead us in the right direction. And if we look back and take a reading of what happened between these 35 years, if we go back 35 years, the record on how we've understood change over this time is, is fairly mixed. If I think about 1980 New York City and the other major American cities, at least, uh, they were very much in the throes of population loss and job loss, uh, and leaving the cities very much divided places of haves and have-nots. Uh, public transportation systems built for them had assumed a strong magnetic pull that continued to marginalize those who stayed in the city and were left behind as their opportunities for jobs moved outward. Regional planning was resisted, in fact, in the 1980s, and divisions between the groups hardened. Now, today's New York City is quite a different place, and uh, the real estate prices in Brooklyn certainly attest to all of that. But the marginalized continued to be marginalized and excluded. And, and, and we can certainly, uh, anybody walking the streets or taking the subway can see that still. Then again, if you look back at 1980, the global, uh, uh, global divide between, that the Cold War put in place, and each side marginalizing the other, would any of us have accurately predicted today's European cities and their current populations and how easily uh, many of the former Eastern Bloc citizens move now all through Western Europe? And so, of course, will we say the same about the current refugees in 2050, that they do the same? Now, our speakers bring a wealth of information and experience to looking at the future. Claudia Yash is Associate Vice President and Managing Director for Strategic Research at the Rockefeller Foundation, where she's worked since 2007. And she manages a portfolio and team whose strategic function is to identify and assess the potential impact of all sorts of intervention opportunities for the foundation's priority areas. And she established and oversees the foundation's horizon scanning activities to inform and on an ongoing basis at, at the foundation level strategy and areas of programmatic work. So she's got lots and lots of experience thinking about how change takes place and how to identify innovation. 
Our second speaker, Patrick Ellis, joined the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in 2005 as a human geographer, and he's performed open source research and analysis of urban features, neighborhoods, international and internal administrative boundaries, and human geography themes, including population, language, ethnicity, and religion. And he's currently the principal investigator for a collaborative research and development agreement between the NGA and Washington College, examining and, uh, and figuring out how to support the development of a volunteer geographic information system for foundation data production. So we hope that this session then is heading us in the right direction for 2050 to relieve inequality and exclusion to increase economic and social integration, to seek appropriate technological and managerial and other types of innovation, and deploy them for the broadest benefit to enlist many of the excluded in this endeavor, and to increase our imagination to envision the world differently. So let me turn first to Claudia to speak. Thank you very much, Deborah. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me today. As Deborah said, uh, at the Rockefeller Foundation, I'm responsible for identifying and assessing opportunities for future funding. And one thing that I really enjoyed seeing is this little leaflet um, that uh, I assume Chris and his team are responsible for, the Geography 2050 passport. And it's exactly the types of questions, those are exactly the types of questions um, that we would pose to identify opportunities. And why are we, why are we doing that? I mean, one of the um, goals of the Rockefeller Foundation is to work on creating more resilient and more inclusive cities. We work generally on improving the lives of poor, vulnerable populations around the globe, and we have a grant-making budget of about 200 million per year. And as you probably can imagine, I mean, there are so many pressing challenges uh, out there. And how do we really identify where the Rockefeller Foundation could have the greatest impact with what we bring to the table? In the background, uh, on the slide, you see Makoko, which is a slum dwelling in, uh, or a slum area in Lagos, uh, the, the largest city in Nigeria. And this shows only one of the, the pressing problems that city face, cities face today, which is economic marginalization, and in this case also the disease burden of people living in slums. About 250,000 people live in Makoko, and they were literally pushed off the land uh, and now live uh, on, on the water and I think Patrick will talk a little bit more about how these people are excluded from the economic prosperity that you can also see in Lagos at the same time um, and, um, uh, and the challenges that that creates. So we really want to know where can we invest on all of these pressing, uh, of which one of the pressing problems can we invest and where can we have the greatest impact. And we use methods and tools from strategic foresight and futures research uh, to do that. So we really want to understand where is the world going and we want to understand where are trends and shifts happening that would give us basically wind in our backs and make more of the investment that we can bring to the table. So in the case of cities, that means what's driving potential change in cities and how can we get ahead of those challenges or those changes that really reinforce exclusion and catalyze those that will in advance inclusion? Um, that is, I think, a critical question that we, that we raise, um, uh, raise when we do those investigations. Sometimes, um, Tongue-in-cheek, I'm called the in-house futurist of the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, as a futurist and thinking about 2050, I had a couple of thoughts, general thoughts, before I get to a few uh, substantive uh, areas. One is, clearly, there are always multiple futures. So we don't know what the future is going to bring. Uh, and it's not an extrapolation of the present. And we heard a lot about the present already, but. It, 
And many of the things that we are going to see in the future are already visible in the present, but will really take on shape uh, in the years that come. And we are likely not going to see a dystopian future, and we are likely not going to see utopia. We are always likely going to see a mix uh, of these two um, extremes. The other point that I quickly wanted to make is, um, I, I mean, I certainly applaud the organizers to, for taking 2050 uh, as the time horizon. For cities, it might even be useful to think further ahead because of the infrastructure lock-in that was already mentioned uh, this morning. And the last point um, that I would like to make uh, as a general comment is that we tend to overestimate the change that's going to happen in the next, let's say, five years. So I know at the moment there's a lot of talk about driverless vehicles uh, and, and things like that. I suspect that we only see that uh, and, and then it will have major implications in probably uh, over a longer time frame. Um, but we have a tendency to, to overestimate what that is. And flying cars are always there, um, uh, but I think we are still further away from, from that. But what we dramatically underestimate is really the change in the long run. Uh, over 25 to 50 years. So for example, in the 70s, we obviously had no idea about the computer power that at one point we are going to hold in our hands, uh, thinking about what computer meant uh, at the time, or that drones would be able to follow skiers uh, um, and uh, kind of people who snowboard off cliffs and taking aerial action shots. So, I mean, these are things that we, that we really couldn't, couldn't imagine. So thinking audaciously about 2050, um, one thing that, that we like to do in, in futures is to think about what are potential drivers and what, what are potential kind of, what negative shape could they take and what positive shape could they take. Uh, and one uh, driver that I wanted to talk about is remote work and online education. I mean, this is nothing new, you clearly know. Um, people work, start working from home more, uh, and they are clearly the, the MOOCs that provide online courses, and they have become increasingly common, but they are not yet fully widespread. So if you now think about that driver, and you take it in a positive direction, what can that mean in, in 2050, and what are the potential implications? It could mean that if we do most things from our home or a location of our choosing, that zip code as a destiny is no longer what it is today. Uh, and um, that people wouldn't be restricted from participating uh, in, in economies because commuting wouldn't be such a big problem and it wouldn't limit, for example, single parents uh, to participate in, um, uh, in or to have jobs. Right now, I mean, many people live in, uh, poor people especially, live in the least accessible parts of the city. And you already saw that this morning uh, when David Wine spoke about Accra, uh, and they have long and sometimes unsafe commutes, and uh, Accra is one of those examples, but it's also Hanoi and, and other cities as well. But if we think about 2050, if there were no or limited commuting, that would enable more working parents, and especially the huge percentage of single parents around the world, and that is 70% of household, households in Haiti and 35% in the US, to better care for their families and provide opportunities for the next um, generation. It might also mean less, less exclu exclusion based on gender. In many countries, it's unsafe for women to go to work or to work in certain professions, or they are simply kept out of professions because they are for men only. Um, the same is true for schools, and, and girls are often pulled out to support their families at a young age, uh, and globally there are four million less girls in schools, uh, in primary schools, than, than boys. And so might the ability for remote work opportunities and education really reduce this gender gap uh, of exclusion and enable greater e equity uh, and uh, participation across genders? 
So that's kind of how the positive shape that this driver could take. But if you turn it and look at a potential negative form, um, then you could also think about the rise of a virtual geography. So what if we have virtual zip codes in a way. So right now we are maybe all on LinkedIn, but increasingly you can see that we are invited to be part of certain networks and others are excluded to be part of those networks. So could we imagine a future in 2015 where actually um, the same barriers um, exist and uh, where the connection that we have because of where we come from and because of our socioeconomic uh, status is basically just transferred onto a um, social platform or a virtual platform. The other driver that I quickly wanted to highlight is the rise of place moving interventions in the US. Um, I mean, you probably have heard of this. There is the, um, the, um, the, the, the data and the research from the um, uh, two Harvard researchers, Raj Shetty and Nathaniel Hendren uh, at Harvard, that really talked about this uh, in, in great detail and it got a lot of attention. But uh, basically, I mean, what we all know, um, your, your future income and your future opportunities are very much informed by where you grow up and, and where you live. And um, those findings uh, clearly um, provided further insight into, into that um, and um, um, indicated that if people at a relatively young age move from a low mobility place to a high mobility place, it really increases health outcomes and adult earnings. Um, and that correlates to each year that you spend in the high mobility place. And I have, I think, a slide on, on that. Um, and High mobility places obviously have better schools, um, have a higher share of two parent families and uh, greater levels of involvement in civic and religious community groups uh, and more residential integration of affluent middle class and poor families. So a number of or many policy makers uh, and nonprofits are already moved by this evidence. So we could imagine a future where in 2015, more people are moving instead of us focusing on making bad places better. Um, um, and that um, kind of, there's more investment in place moving inter interventions. And that could mean less segregation. Um, segregation by income is persuasive in the, pervasive in the US. It's anecdotally rising in some European cities as well, and I think it will be interesting to see what impact the refugee crisis, crisis will have on that as, um, as well. Um, but um, we can, could clearly see the, the benefits of, of that. But turning, uh, turning this around, uh, turning again this around, uh, and thinking about what are the potential negative implications of place moving interventions, I think it raises the question of what happens to the places that people leave behind uh, and who's staying at those places and does that mean that the, the people who are the most marginalized and the ultra poor actually then um, again the people who are the worst off and are those as we heard maybe uh, already undocumented immigrants who fall through the cracks of many government programs um, and uh, I mean other signals that we could see for that are privatization of previously uh, public assets such as pools that has been a major trend across the uh, US so it could mean keeping out uh, more people and having them ghettoized in a way in, in, in bad neighborhoods. So these are not predictions clearly. It's, it's just really food for thought. So um, the, the question is always, what do we need to do now to get to the futures that we think are desirable? Uh, and, and what are the drivers um, that, we, that we should support uh, and promote further? Um, 
I, I'm certainly very interested in line with the work that I do at the Rockefeller Foundation to learn about you know, how you fill this out and what are your thoughts in terms of the drivers that really have the potential for disruptive change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, let's see, Patrick, it's... Uh, <laughs> Look at a, a more particular case to, uh, to develop these thoughts. So, hello again. My name is Patrick Ellis. Um, I'm with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. So, NGA's mission, and I wrote this down because I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, NGA's mission is to deliver world class geospatial intelligence that provides decisive advantage to policymakers, warfighters, and intelligence professionals. So I don't want to steal the thunder of my deputy director who will be giving the keynote tomorrow. Um, so I'll, I'll let her describe NGA a little more. So although my presentation uh, is, is sort of based on megacities and, and the associated slums, I really don't want you to think that that necessarily excludes uh, other urban areas and especially not the secondary cities. So uh, our colleagues who are in the other room right now with with Dr. Lee Schwartz are, are not going to be hearing anything that, that you're going to miss out on. So you get best of both worlds. So how might, how might we think about sort of the future of urbanization in the future? And I think sort of there's a, a key statistic here that 200,000 200, people a day are moving to, to urban centers. Uh, the infrastructure required to handle this kind of input of people, governments really can't keep up. And that, that's gonna be a key, a key point as we, as we go forward. And, and I don't just mean keep up, but there, there are some places where infrastructure improvements can't keep up, but just basic installation, the first water line, they're not going to be able to keep up, never mind making sure that the existing water line can handle the capacity. So in some cases, as, as you saw earlier, there's not even enough land. So in Lagos, Nigeria, many of the folks, the new folks that are coming, there's not going to be land that they're going to be uh, settling on. They're going to be out in the lagoon on stilts. So as, as we've talked earlier, we've talked about disaster management and how, how sea level rise could, could affect some of these, these areas. So you can just imagine storm surge hitting that, uh, hitting that area, and you're going to have a, a giant disaster. So sort of to give you a sort of a juxtaposition of, of some of the plans, so Lagos, Nigeria, this bottom picture is of an area that's going to be called, that's called Eco-Atlantic. So it's sort of the new Nigeria, or the new, the new Lagos. So I don't think it's, it's far to say that the folks who are living in that top picture, they're not going to be moving into the apartments that are in the bottom picture. So those buildings probably are going to be very sustainable. They're probably going to be green technology. They're going to be, you know, cutting edge everything. But that's really not that's not really going to help us with the, the issue that we really have. So if we go back to the idea of, of when, when an issue, oh, it's on the wrong slide, there we go, go back. Uh, so if we think about that storm surge, a lot of governments, would, they're just not going to be able to respond. They can't, we can't get the infrastructure to build we're certainly not going to be able to, to respond in a disaster situation. So when the governments are not able to do this, we end up with a sort of a rise in, in non-government organizations and, and civil society organizations that are really going to have to step up and fill that role. So many of those organizations are very benevolent. They're trying to do the good thing. And obviously, there are going to be others who are maybe not so benevolent. Now, living in the national security sphere, a lot of my colleagues are going to be much more interested in those who are, who are not on the good side. Uh, but I'm actually, for now, going to be looking at 
at those that are uh, trying to trying to do do good things. So all of this, all of the work that we've done is most of it's been led by uh, our primary investigator Doug Batson, and he really wanted to research how do these civil societies, how, how do they operate? How 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 can we work with them in in the case of a disaster management? Uh, much of his work was actually inspired by the, the Santa Fe Institute and a group called the Slum Dwellers International. They've done a lot of research. And he really wants to map out what are the, what's the influence of these, of these organizations? What areas do they sort of control or, or are responsible for? So again, as a, as a member of the intelligence community, the United States intelligence community, and the Department of Defense, it's, it's kind of hard to, to walk out to, to some of these places and say, so trust me, I'm with the US government, and I'm with the DOD and the intelligence community. So it's, it's very hard to, to do that. So we need to figure out a way to sort of build that, build that trust. And disaster management is definitely the area that, that we feel we can, we can do that. So again, sea level rise, that's gonna be a problem. If you're, if you're looking at Lagos, there's going to be, you know, we're, it's already a disaster, but imagine now a storm hits it, how much worse it will be. So, ha, so using that sort of disaster management idea is really how we, how we were able to move forward. So through a, a grant with the National uh, Intelligence University, Doug actually was able to go to Lagos, Nigeria, and try to talk to some of these Civil service, civil, civil service organizations to find civil, excuse me, civilian civil society organizations. There we go. Um, to really get an understanding of if something happens, how do we? Who do I need to talk to to get a thousand able-bodied men to fill sandbags? How do we? Who do I talk to to get water distributed equitably? And maybe even. Who do I talk to to resolve conflicts between two groups? And we want to figure out who are the power brokers. Because in those ungoverned spaces, it's not going to be the government. It's going to be those sort of non-traditional leaders. We very quickly discovered that, that if you talk to an organization and ask them, what area do you, are you concerned with, you control, the area that they describe is going to be very different than the area that perhaps the government might describe. So there are, there are, are differences in even local definitions of places in, within the city of Lagos. So th why that's important is because you have the, the government of Nigeria that will say Lagos has so many administrative areas. Well, the government of Lagos would tell you that they have a lot more different areas. And there, if you think about it, if you think about the way a census block is built, it's really based on population. So if the government thinks that there are fewer places, but Lagos Nigerian governments, or the Lagos city government says that there are more places, then you've, you've already got this sort of split in understanding is how many people you have, how many resources you need. And it doesn't help that, that Lagos their, their city government is really the, it's the opposition party to the one that's in, in government control for the country. So you can see how some politics are gonna really drive some issues. So what does that mean? Well, it means that when the government has resources to be allocated, fewer are gonna go to the city of Lagos. And now let's compound that with the number of people who are gonna be flowing into Lagos. So throughout all the, all the work, there were really sort of three different themes that, that came out. The first is that there's a wide divide between the governments, even the city governments, and these, these civil society organizations. There's definitely mutual suspicion between the two. Neither really trusts the other that they're really out to, to do the good thing. And it even, it's even to the point where the civil society organizations really see government as being indifferent to their, 
to their role of protecting life and liberty. We'll skip that one. That's got a lot of a lot going on. So coming from a, a geospatial organization, thinking about something like hazards, well, I want to get a, I want to see what do the hazards look like in Lagos. Unfortunately, the government of Nigeria and the Lagos Emergency Management Organization, they don't, they don't know. They don't have an idea of if, if there's a flood, where are the areas that are going to be impacted the most? So we wanted to, to create one of those. So this was where the agreement, Cooperative Research and Development Agreement with Washington College really came in. So we were actually able to have students help us by making some of these products. Now, yeah, I'm sure some of our geospatial analysts at NGA could probably have knocked this out pretty quickly, but to, to engage the, the, the academic institutions and to get students to work on, on real issues um, is also kind of a, a, a good benefit. So not only do we get production of products, but they get experience doing real life, real life issues. It's uh, as a, you know, going through college, if you're doing your GIS program, you can always get that canned data, but to actually have real, real data that actually has real implications um, has always been a, an added benefit. Also through this, we were able to, to have them look at where are the, the facilities that are going to be necessary during disaster management? Where are the hospitals that we're going to need to make sure we can get the power turned back on? Where are the... Where are, the, where are the schools? Where's the field that, where's the school that has a soccer field that we can land helicopters to unload equipment? Uh, these, are, these are kind of things that, yes, we could do it ourselves, but again, we wanted to sort of employ, employ the school to get them sort of thinking about, about what they might do to help us. So it's a little bit different take. Um, the economic exclusion part, so from NGA, it's a concern for us but sort of the, the policy part isn't really our, it's not really our lane. But for us, we want to be able to figure out how do we, how do we show what's happening? How do we, how do we show mm -hmm. the, that, that exclusion? Uh, how, do we, how do we collect that information? You can only get so much from a satellite in order to find out where's this civil society organization, where do they operate? Well, you, have to, you really have to be on the ground and you really have to ask them. Uh, so this is sort of, again, our our idea of we can't, we can't keep working from a, from a skiffed facility and only use our satellites. We really have to, to think about other, other ways to get information. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have time. I, maybe I can ask the first question. You can ask the second question. You can ask the third question, and then we can open it up. How does that sound? OK, we'll, 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 roll, we'll roll this along. And, and, and actually, as both of you talk, raised numbers of interesting, uh, interesting issues and is interesting points. Um, one is certainly that we need to identify the forces for change, and, and actually also the forces for stability that are the, uh, the good forces for stability, or what can change, what won't change. Um, but much of that has to be working through civil society organizations probably on the ground NGOs, which I am sure you, you work heavily with. And how do you identify them, given that they're not necessarily easily, uh, I, they may be identified, but how do you identify the, the ones that are going to be effective? And then what do you demand of them, given that they're working on intractable Problems. I think yeah, you can't, you know, what kinds of results can you ask of them? Very challenging question, uh, but, I, but, but I'll try and answer. I mean, one thing that we do, you may know we have that initiative of 100 Resilient Cities. Yes. Uh, and we are currently active in 66, close to 70 cities, and, um, and, and now looking at the next tranche. And, and I feel that's, that's very close to what you spoke about and, and also touches, I think, the, the heart of your question. Um, what we are, one, important part that we work on with those cities that are members or 
part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network is to develop really a resiliency strategy. And first, of course, that starts with identifying what are the risks. And I feel the, the piece that I would like to highlight in addition to what you talked about, Patrick, is really the more holistic picture. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there, there's the danger of flooding, um, but the question of what is the social cohesion, where are the social tensions, because in those moments of emergency, the different neighborhoods of the city need to come together, and so where are the, the kind of the, the biggest things that could fail, uh, mm -hmm. in a way, and so that's kind of the first piece too, um, that, that needs to be explored, and exactly that's explored by means of doing workshops within those cities. We have a resilient city officer that we fund for the first couple of years who's typically located in the mayor's office. And then that person helps us or we, we provide additional supports to, to bring then those multi-stakeholder multi groups together. And obviously that's not easy. I mean, that those are, um, um, uh, k kind of meetings with, let's say, a hundred people in the room, where um, you know, where there, is, there are people who haven't really talked together or kind of who have difficulties entering a dialogue. So mm -hmm. there is, in a way, no easy. I, I guess what I'm saying is there is no easy solution. I mean, I think it's about the things that we know. We need to bring those people together. They have together, in a way, agree and identify. And it's interesting that really the the kind of these areas um, uh, vary where kind of the the, the, the biggest risks are for those cities vary across cities, and then that also means what are the kind of the resiliency strategies need to be be different. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, I think effectiveness is probably something where we look to the past, where are the uh, CSOs, the civil society organizations that have credibility. I mean, th that is often something that we really draw on people in the cities to help us uh, navigate those waters. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything or no? Uh, I think I think for us there's just because we're because we're from you know the government there's there's need to go through official channels. So mm. so for us to travel to Nigeria means we have to work with the Nigerian government. Well, now you're going to tell the Nigerian government that you want to work with organizations that they don't trust either. So so now you've got to. But for us, it's a giant, that just, I think, adds just another level of, of challenge um, that, that may or may not be something that we could even, you know, Approach. really deal with. Yeah. Right. Did, did you indeed have a question? Or, or, or? I think my, my question was on how you're thinking about, let's say, um, what do you do in, the term, in terms of a, when a disaster happens? How are you thinking about the holistic picture? So these other elements, instead of mostly looking at it from, a, let's say, an engineering or maybe an urban planning perspective. So, so for us, it's more. I think for us, it's more an issue of how do we how do we gather the information so that someone can make an informed decision. Um, you know, the, something happens, the Marines are going to land. They're going to need they're going to need that sort of base knowledge, and that's really the part that we're that we really want to try to provide and, and, yeah. and collect for them. So there, there's definitely going to be you know, a lot of learning once, you know, once they land, there'd be a lot of, of, of learning and they'd be reaching out to these groups. Um, but we're really, really trying to figure out how to, how to sort of kickstart that, how to get the Rolodex of, hey, these are the people that are probably going to be you know, most influential. And keep that Rolodex up to date, in fact, which is, I would assume, again, if we're looking to 2035, it's uh, not 2035, 30, uh, yeah, I've got 35 in my head because I was subtracting. 2050, those things are changing all the time in, in these places, aren't they? That's, so you need those new people. Did you have anything oh, no. or shall we, uh, shall we open? Let's see, and I, 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 I see a hand. Is it? across different cities and that the strategies would vary across different cities in terms of resiliency. And I'm wondering if one of your outcomes might be a set of best practices. And if it were to be developed, are you looking at, for example, 
by city size or by s um, type of challenge? Uh, and would that be then uh, pre presented on an open platform? So at the moment, it's more informal. We started the uh, 100 Resilient Cities uh, activities about a year and a half ago, uh, really, and then, you know, it always takes a while to really begin with the implementation. At the moment, it's we are bringing these resilient city officers together, um, uh, sometimes with the mayors and, and other uh, kind of people from those cities. Uh, and so it's a more informal sharing. But uh, uh, I, 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 could, I certainly see that um, once we have all 100 resilient cities in place, that we produce those case studies and we would certainly share them uh, and, and make them widely available. Um, I, it's, it's though interesting, I mean, in my kind of with 100 resilient cities is not my initiative. I work really at the early stages of the pipeline. And we just investigated something around economic exclusion in cities. And I drew some of the ideas that I shared today uh, from that work. And uh, there we try to work because we, we want to have impact at scale. So that means we need to identify you know, what could work generalizable across cities. And so we try to come up in the, in the context of economic exclusion with the typology of cities. And I don't think we did very well. I mean, we are still in the early stages, but I, I think there was nothing really when we kind of, we looked at eight, eight case studies uh, of different cities in the US, uh, in Australia, and in, in Europe. So we were looking at high income cities in this case and poor vulnerable populations. But there wasn't, I mean, the kind of how economic exclusion um, kind of shows is, is really quite different. And it depends on what are cities, what can cities even deal with themselves and what's dealt with at the national level. I mean, there are really kind of many, many things that make that work very context specific and place based. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, let's see. Oh. Hi, uh, I'm Manju and I'm a graduate student in urban planning. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Ellis because um, I know you spoke about the, the political aspects of collecting information while going into the field. Um, I was just wondering about your experiences, if any, about in uh, the use of uh, volunteer geographic information. Uh, how has that been? Because I'm in a course in uh, public participatory GIS, so it would help for me to know that. Yeah, thank you. So if, if I understand the question, how are we using that VGI type work? Yes, has there been any success with it? Or what are your uh, perceptions about VGI in um, disaster management? So we haven't, uh, we really haven't tried to figure out how to do that yet. Um, the, the volunteer work that we're working on right now is really more on the sort of how to use the, the, the technology and the platform sort of internally for how we create our own data. It's, we haven't really worked on how we might use it reaching out for, for this kind of information yet. Did, did you want to maybe talk a bit about generating it, the, the volunteer, or, or collecting it? Maybe, is that part of your question or no? Yes. Uh, I mean, really, it's, it comes down to, uh, again, that, that reaching out. And that's, we just haven't, we really haven't done that. Let's see. Uh, there, I, I can see other questions. Let's see. With the, who, you, you got the mic? Yeah. Last, okay, last question. So okay. make it a good one. I, I'll try to. Yes, it's yes. along the same lines. <laughs> I teach at a community college in northern Michigan, and uh, anthropology class uh, particularly. And I'm wondering, do you guys use ethnographers at the Rockefeller Center and at the Defen Department of Defense? Um, do you send ethnographers out, anthropologists, uh, initially in order to gather the, the data, the qualitative data? So um, I probably 
would say we are not consistently doing that, but I know that one of our new initiatives that focuses on different contexts, post-harvest loss uh, in, in, in Africa, uh, we have done an ethnographic study uh, and also did some human-centered design. So uh, we did work in, in that area and drew on that type of data to think about what could be the best interventions that we could do in that space and support. I think for us, um, I think the quick first answer is we haven't. Um, but I think it is something that we need to look into, into actually doing. Okay. Well, thank you to the two of you. Thank you to the audience. And um, I think the next this, this is the end of our session, but I think very interesting. They will be available to talk subsequent, uh, subsequently and look forward to the afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.